Welcome everyone to today's webcast, the 10 backup mistakes that MSPs make and how to avoid them. I'm your host, Nick Cavalancio with Tech Evangelism. Uh, I'm a 25 year IT veteran, a Microsoft MVP and a former MSP owner myself. Uh, I'm joined today by Steve Putnam from PC Wizard. Steve is a senior cloud solutions architect with them and backup specialist uh, with PC Wizard. They're a small MSP located in Northwestern Connecticut. Steve actually retired in 2013 after 40 years in IT with a Fortune 500 company. That's something that not all of us have quite gotten to yet. And shortly afterwards, and I find this very interesting, we had a conversation about this beforehand. Um, after he retired, his son who founded uh, PC Wizard and is the owner, he asked him to evaluate, select, test, and implement a new cloud backup service. And so lo and behold, he's continued in a part-time capacity as their resident and backup expert, and has also successfully deployed RMM and PSA solutions to PC Wizards customers, et cetera, et cetera. Steve, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, hi, Nick. Thanks for letting me talk about my favorite topic. Your favorite topic, indeed. And believe me, it is a favorite topic. We had a conversation beforehand. Now, for you guys in the audience, um, this is a little bit of a different webcast. It's not death by PowerPoint. I think we've got a total of maybe like seven slides for the entire duration of the webcast today. Um, so this is more of a conversational format. The slides, I want you to be thinking of the visuals that we have today is more of a maybe a visual indicator of where we are in the conversation rather than being the focus. We also want to make this, as since it is a conversation, we want to include you in on that conversation. So I am watching the Q&A box throughout. So as we're having these conversations and we're talking back and forth a little bit, we'd love to have you interject. If you've got a comment, a question, an anecdote, a story, something, or anything you want to put in, you want to participate in, we'd love to have you participate with us. And then, of course, we will still have formal, formal Q&A at the very end, the last 10 minutes or so of the webcast. So. Um, please feel free, like you can participate in the webcast today because we'd love to have you do that. And so with that, let me kind of introduce today's topic a little bit. Um, you know, if you think about backups as a, a service, if you will, a service that you're providing to your customers, even backups have to be predictable. Now, I'm a big believer, and I, I say to every time I talk to an MSP audience, predictability breeds profitability. If you have a predictable business, you know exactly how much time it's going to take, exactly how many resources it's going to be, how much it's going to cost you, blah, 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 all that stuff. You can calculate what your profit's going to be on that predictable business. And one of the challenges with backups, of course, is um, whether or not you actually have a good backup enough so that you can recover and there becomes some unpredictability in that nature as well. Um, also, what if the backups are good? How do you know they're good? I mean, things like that. So there's a lot of sort of issues that come into play that keep you from having a truly predictable business, but that's still the goal. You want to get to predictable. And so the secret actually lies in defining your service in terms of how it's going to be configured, how it's architected, how you're going to, let's say, if to get tactical for a moment, how you're going to actually define your backups that are going to be able to protect this given server or set of workstations or whatever it happens to be, and then how you're going to deliver that service to the customer. There are ways, as long as you define it, not just leave it as something, well, eh, we'll make some backup copies every day. You know, that's not a service. It's actually defining it just like everything else you do, your RMM, if you're doing security, all those kinds of things as well. Now, some of you might be new to backups, and that's okay. Uh, we're glad that you're here. Some of you are not new to backups, and we're still glad you're here because there's still mistakes that um, every MSP is making. And so the idea here is we wanted to bring Steve in. We want to talk about 10 different mistakes that, that are very common across many MSPs, and we'll kind of talk about how to avoid them as well. Now, what we've done is we've broken them up into four areas, and it sort of follows through sort of a, a, a timeline, if you will, starting with your, the backups you're performing the management of your backups, the recovery um, scenarios that you may have to work through, and then thinking about backup as a business. And then we want to talk about throughout these four different aspects of it, we're going to talk about 10 different mistakes. So the, the first area we're going to start with, of course, is backup mistakes. For, you have to create backups before you can ever do recovery, before you can ever manage them. You've got to uh, create the backups in the first place. The, the first two backup mistakes we have, the first one is here is um, not actually using the cloud for backups. Some of you still might be utilizing on uh, tape, on-premises, uh, hard disk storage, those kind of things, just when you're utilizing that. And what's fine, at least you have a backup copy. But if you think about the different kinds of losses that can be um, excuse me, that can occur. You can have a loss of just data or you like files. You can have a loss of a system, a loss of application. You can also have loss of location. And so when you have just 
um, on-premises based backups and you don't have the cloud for backups, you don't have an ability to protect your customers against that loss of location. So that way, if it's a natural disaster or there's a flood, like I said, it's a natural disaster, a power outage you know, to an entire area, they don't know when it's going to come back up, it's going to take days, whatever it is, you know, the cloud is what's going to help facilitate that. Um, Steve, let me, let me actually just kind of bring you into the conversation here. Let's talk about this first mistake a little bit. What are some of the ways you've seen both customers and MSPs uh, that you've replaced, how they how have they attempted to try and address backups where the cloud wasn't used? Yeah, well, let me just first clarify the customers that I'm going to be talking about today are the small, medium businesses, not uh, not the residential clients that many of the MSPs still sure. service. Uh, they don't usually have the mission critical data. But you know, up until recently, a lot of the customers and even a lot of the IT service providers are leery of using the cloud. So, as you said, they, they rely on local backups only. Um, you know, tape drives not as prevalent as they used to be, but yep. Some people were, even when we signed them up a couple of years ago, they were still using tape drives, which isn't bad in of itself, but they were using the same tapes over and over again, and they never tested them. So they didn't know if they were any good at all. So uh, we had one customer who swore they were doing great backups. They were copying all their files to a thumb drive every day, and that was it, one thumb drive. Wow. Now, so, you know, it's, now, you know, recently the cloud has, you know, become more acceptable to both customers and MSPs. But, you know, and you still need to have a local backup, but you have to be sure that it's actually working, you know. And the trouble with the local backups, if you only use local backups, is USB drives, NASs, they fail. Once that drive is dead, all the backups, all the old versions are gone. You know, there's, Particularly if it's that one the, USB over and over and over again or that one tape over yeah and over. it's it's and they well yeah i mean <laughs> and you know tapes are just notoriously unreliable but uh so you know that's where that really the cloud solutions shine in that we don't have to worry about the underlying infrastructure ever now, they worry about that so you can we have backups that are four years old we don't know or care what amazon or google are storing them on They're, they'll always be accessible yeah, and, and there's a, a certain assumption of, um, of integrity for the data, so that works. And there's well, another the aspect of this with the, with the cloud is like the three to one backup rule. I'm assuming all you guys in the audience know what the three to one backup rule is, but if you don't, um, it's you're going to have three copies of your data, and and your production data is considered one of those copies. You should have at least two different mediums being used, and one of them should be offsite. So therefore, the one, the the, the one in the three to one backup rule can be, obviously be the cloud. So um, maybe Maybe see if I can ask you, what are you doing with your customers to kind of align with that best practice? Yeah, well, at the, at the PC Wizard, we have a slightly different 3 2, one strategy. Okay. We have, three, we have three backup copies, two in the cloud and one local. And, and they, they make fun of me here. They tell me I'm a two belts and a suspenders person. But <laughs> I, like having, <laughs> I like having three backups. You know, our standard offering includes daily file backups to a local device, you know, it's USB or NAS box. With a guaranteed one, with a non-guaranteed one-year version retention, because you know if the drive fails, well, they're gone. Yeah. We also send nightly file backups to both Amazon and Google with a guaranteed 90-day retention as our standard offering, and, and they can get longer retentions if they if they want it. So you know, it, I know that's uncommon for anyone to send backups to two cloud locations. So I mean, I can explain how and why we ended up that way if anybody well, cares to hear. You have you have a little bit of bandwidth if you want to spend just a small amount of time. Yeah, what's what's the what's the rationale for having both? Is it just you don't trust one provider yeah, or well, the other? Or? Well, we started with back in 2014 when we started with CloudBerry Managed Backup. Amazon was really the only industrial strength cloud platform that was available at the time. So I mean, it was around three cents per gig per month. Um, but we couldn't we couldn't leverage the migration. I mean, some of you are familiar with the fact that you can use lifecycle policies to migrate data from Amazon to Glacier. The trouble with we couldn't do that as it was our only primary cloud backup solution. Um, if you move something to Glacier, you get a five-hour delay until the restore can start. So you really can't use that as a primary, can't use Glacier as a primary no. backup source. But in January 2016, Google came out with something called Nearline, which is their second tier of storage. Only cost a penny a gig per month. So we contemplated switching from Amazon over to Google Nearline. But we realized that, uh, you know, we could use Google as our standard platform and then start using the lifecycle policy migration to Glacier. 
Amazon Glacier only cost then 0.7 cents per gig, and now it's 0.4 cents per gig. So we thought instead of migrating 15 terabytes of data from and re-uploading everything, let's just keep both of them. That way we have two copies in the cloud. And we tell customers, yeah, well, we've got two secure storage platforms. And there's been times when it saved us because the file that we needed wasn't in one, but it was in the other. It's interesting because we always think in, in IT terms of having redundancy. And even, even I, I, mean, I, I work from home for the most part today as a technical evangelist full time. I'm mostly either on the road or I'm writing at a, at a desk in my office at my house. And even I have redundancies. I have redundancies for systems. I have redundancies for backup, redundancies for power, redundancies for internet. So I, I kind of like this, this mentality. I'm not necessarily that saying that all of you in the audience, if you're going to be offering backups, you must have two cloud providers. That's not what no, anyone's saying. No, you don't need to. But, but it, it costs us less than two cents per gig combined yeah, per month. That makes sense. And so that's such a small portion of the cost of delivering a backup service that we, you know, it's, and again, it, it, it actually saves us in that uh, we've had situations where a mistake was made in a backup plan. We don't clone backup plans because we don't want to clone a mistake. So we actually recreate them from scratch each time. And sure enough, we had a situation where one of them, that didn't have the data being backed up that it should have, but the other one did. So okay, again, it's just another, you know, reason to have the redundancy. So, and it's just well, so I, inexpensive. I do like the two belts and suspenders. I'm going to, I'm going to try to find a, write a <laughs> blog like about it someday and quote you on it. I don't know. Um, so let's talk about the second backup mistake here. And that is allowing customers to manage backups. Now you guys in the audience, you can already kind of see where this one's going, or you've already experienced it one way or the other. Some of the obvious things, just so we level set, most customers are not as technical as you are. Otherwise, they wouldn't be using you, right? Okay. Um, but you do have those customers that feel like they're somewhat technically savvy. And so they're like, well, I can restore a file or I can make the backups or I can make sure that it works. And they want to try to maybe offload some of the service from you. And, and it ends up being kind of a one-off kind of situation. Those kind of things happen. Anytime you say one-off when it comes to an MSP, that, that just smells and reeks of unpredictability, which means it's not going to be profitable probably not the right answer, but, um, but there's obviously some issues with having customers manage their backups themselves. And so, um, so Steve, while obviously this might be a little obvious to our audience because customers aren't as technical as they are, mm -hmm. um, what are some of the issues that you've come across with customers when they're left to manage their own backups? Yeah, well, I mean, when we first started offering Wizard Cloud Backup, that's our branded version of the Cloudberry Managed Backup. Uh, some of the customers wanted to be trained on how to monitor and manage the backup, set up the plans, resolve the issues. So we did. We trained them. You know, we spent a half an hour, an hour with them, because they felt they were technically savvy, as you said. But uh, it became very clear early on that these clients weren't actually paying any attention to the backups. They weren't making any of the changes. They, they couldn't remember the passwords or the encryption key, so they ended up calling us for everything anyway. So, you know, we we realized that it just it's not their focus at all. The backups. So, you know. They would handle it once in a while. We do it all day, every day. That's a good point. I, I always like to uh, use the analogy of, I remember uh, um, having a customer that was a clothing manufacturer, and um, but they outsourced their zippers. And uh, I like to use that analogy because it applies in so many ways to IT. It's like going to the customer and saying, okay, wait a second. Is your, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, is your time better spent you know, trying to make the zipper or just, I make zippers all day long. Just let me make the zipper for you and I'll give you a fully functional zipper and then you can go do whatever you want with it. And then, and if you think about it, if you're a clothing manufacturer, unless you own like a zipper sub subsidiary company or something, right? It just makes more sense. Let's just, we can sew the, the jackets together and we'll just buy the zipper and, and sew it into our jacket. It's so much more cost effective. And so I agree with you wholeheartedly there. Um, so there's sort of a, a question that might be out there for some in the audience where they might have this scenario with a customer that wants to do some portion, whatever portion it is, of managing the backups in your own opinion. And it's just the opinion of one guy, but still evaluate. it. So in your opinion, should customers be given any sort of capabilities around managing backups? Well, in a word, no. MSP should be <laughs> in complete that. control. You knew I was going to say that. Uh, yeah. The MSPs have to be in complete control of the backups. You know, we, we do have the system, you know, send emails whenever the, the, the completion of every of the Amazon backup plans. We don't send it for all the backup plans. 
But we tell clients that they don't need to contact us if anything goes wrong. We'll fix the problem, and we'll let them know what we did. So when we sign up clients for a you know, managed backup service, we tell them they have just one responsibility, not a capability, but a responsibility, and that's to make us aware of any applications or upgrades or you know, major changes to the directory structure so that we can adjust the backup plans and properly protect the data. So that's their responsibility, but basically everything else, leave it to us. That way we don't have to, we don't have to introduce their errors because uh, ultimately we're responsible. Yep, I, I think there's probably not anyone in the audience, I'm hoping, that would disagree. If you do disagree, you can pop something in the Q&A box. I'll be happy to, to entertain it. But I'm thinking for the most part, um, everyone here is in violent agreement that, um, you know, w we exist as MSPs because customers don't know how to do it themselves. That, that's the very reason why you should be the ones in charge. So let's um, let's move on and talk about the, the next set of mistakes, which are management mistakes. So here we're talking, here we kind of moved on theoretically for you in the audience uh, in the timeline here, we've created the backups, now the backups exist. And now we're talking about you know, managing the process. And Steve kind of just alluded to like, hey, if something goes wrong, we'll take care of it, whether it's automatically or manually or whatever, but that's all the management, making sure that everything is um, both you know properly defined in case there are those changes. There's the things like backups that do fail and how do you go and make sure that the backup is made so that you're still protected within the context of any recovery time objectives, recovery point objectives that you've agreed on, you know, recovery SLAs, that kind of thing. So there's a three mistakes that we've got here that we're going to cover. The first one is just not having enough resources. And by resources, we're not just talking about like um, hardware and software. We are talking about that, but also people. Um, and having you know an, enough dedicated to the idea around managing backups. So this is probably more of an MSP side than anything. But um, but, but Steve, in fact, let, let's talk about this a little bit. What staffing resources do you normally recommend, and what responsibilities should you know if there are people? What should what responsibilities should each of them have? Sure. Well, let, let's face it, Nick. Backup is the least glamorous of all the IT services. It's it's like the last thing anyone thinks about, unless of course there's a server performance problem, then everybody blames the backups. But people tend to skimp on managing the backup service. I don't know why, but you know, first, all MSPs have to be sure that all their techs are properly trained in backup and recovery procedures and you know, how to use the management portal. So that you know, whenever there's a request for a restore or creating a new plan, uh, you know, any, pretty much anyone can do it. But the thing that gets neglected is someone needs to be designated as a backup specialist and he or she needs to be given the time to perform the duties and there's a lot of them i'm gonna I, i'll just quickly run through a a list of things that cool. you know you have to have someone check the backups every day of course to detect and correct failed overdue and long-running backups you gotta let the customers know you know of the the problem in the resolution you have to do version upgrades you got to submit and follow up on support cases got to document and test recovery procedures, perform periodic recovery testing for your clients, maintain the encryption keys, monitor the cloud storage uses so you don't get you know, a whole bunch of orphaned image files that are chewing up uh, terabytes of data. You got to handle license renewals. You got to test new features and let the other techs know about them. So, I mean, all these activities take time and that, you know, if you, everybody's like PC Wizard, that something is in short supply. But if you neglect them, Murphy's going to get you, you know, that's what, you know, it's, it's just, go ahead. No, I, I, I would completely agree. It's um, the success in, in, well, in essence, success in recovery, because, you know, backups are just the, the means to get to the end, which is recovery. The successful recoveries are, are very, I mean, they're, they're equally de dependent upon how prepared you guys are. I love the fact that you mentioned testing, uh, testing backups, uh, even, you know, doing um, any kind of simulation restore processes to see to make sure that a recovery is actually possible. That gets you maybe little more advanced out of just providing backup as a service, but maybe also providing recovery as a service, so that kind of thing as well. But yeah, well, I, 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 I consider totally them all together. It's backup and recovery as a we, service. Agreed. I mean, we, we put the two together, but, but all this testing, it, it, it does take time, but if you don't do it, um, you know, you, you're leaving yourself open because mistakes can creep in. Errors creep in. They creep into backup plans. You know, they, they creep in all kinds of places. People type in the wrong encryption key. So we actually do tests. We use Cloudbear Explorer for it. We test new documents and old documents to make sure that the encryption key hasn't changed. 
Interesting. Um, and I, I, the, the whole idea of testing there is also because the human error can be something as simple as you guys in the audience. You might think you have the right definition for a backup. Some human, what you or someone else, had to go into whatever solution you're using and click this, click that, click the other thing. And you're, you're yeah. eventually a human being is involved mm -hmm. to some degree, depending on how the solution is configured. It's always possible that you're going to uh, improperly define your backups as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I like the idea of having you know, a number of people, a backup specialist, mm -hmm. certainly, and giving them time. That was really important. You said that. I like that. Any, any other comments on this one? No, I just, it's probably the most important thing and, and the biggest mistake that uh, companies make uh, is not having somebody who is the expert. I mean, it's it's another reason to just have one solution because you don't want to be doing all this for two separate products, but we can talk about that, I'm sure, a little bit later. Yep. So, good. Let's talk about the next one here. This is one that um, Steve and I had a little bit of conversation about this beforehand. Um, and this is, you know, trying to use um, uh, the Windows, the WS, WDS for Windows Deployment Services and the redirected folders as part of helping manage your endpoints, your workstations, your laptops, that kind of thing, as opposed to, let's say, um, trying to back up every single workstation, which in essence, if you think about it, the workstation itself, putting aside like any files in a My Documents folder, but everything else roughly isn't changing on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, I know technically there's lots of things, page files changing and blah, 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 but I mean, it's by and large, it's a, you know, it's a Windows workstation with Office on it for the sake of conversation. And that doesn't change over, change much over time. So the idea of backing every workstation up, every workstation up, probably doesn't make sense for most of your customers, maybe selectively doing it. If for the, the CEO or someone who's really important, are you sure? Yeah, but otherwise, um, using like Windows deployment services to push out an oper uh, operating system and applications and that kind of thing, using redirected folders, maybe for taking your My Documents instead of having them stored on the server and then backing that server up instead. Some on those lines can actually make sense uh, in a lot of ways. And that becomes, if you want to define it this way, it becomes part of your um, of your backup services because you're providing a way to recover. It's just a different way. It's a different medium, a different application that's being used and so on. But in essence, that's what you're doing. You're trying to make sure that the business operations can be um, recovered. And so, um, Steve, I know that you kind of agree with me. There shouldn't be a necessity to, to back up every single workstation, maybe some, but not every single one of them. So would you talk a little bit about how you leverage these two technologies to facilitate, yeah, sure. and I'm doing sure. air quotes here, recovery, you know, as it were? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, let me just clarify this this these features only apply to your clients who have Windows servers. I mean, we have a few clients, you know, quite a few clients actually just have, you know, one or two workstations, they don't actually have a server. Uh so these don't apply there, but you know, by by using redirected folders, you know, you simply tell all the clients, all the customers that you store it in your document and we actually redirect the desktop. So if you're storing your desktop, it'll get backed up in the server. But if you put it anywhere else, it's not going to get backed up, which means you can't recover it. So we, we have to drill that into these folks that you got to save it in your My Documents folder. Um, or obviously, you know, if it's an application, it gets stored on a, in a shared directory. But uh, so that way, you know, we don't have to back up workstations. And, you know, now and then there'll be a, you know, a one-off type thing where there's a, uh, a pan scan machine at a dental office or something like that, you know, that stores its data locally. Well, that's a different story. But you know, as for image backups, you know, for our customers with, that, that have a server and they have, you know, any more than eight or nine workstations, we use Windows deployment services so that we can re-image a device very quickly and remotely. We don't have to go to the customer site to do it. They don't have to bring the machine to us. Um, you know, for the other customers that you know have fewer machines, uh, a lot of them have an old spare machine. So in the, the rare instance when they have to rebuild a machine, typically due to a failed hard drive, uh, we just tell them, use your spare and uh, drop the bad one off to our office. We'll you know, reload it and, and send it back out. Because as you said, they don't typically have a lot installed on the individual workstations if they have a server. And that makes sense. So let's do this. Let's talk about the third one here, which is 
not protecting backups. Um, for, for most of you guys in the audience, you, you think about your backups and you store them. Let's, let's put aside tape. Let's just assume the tape is not being used today. But even if it's on hard disk, um, there's an aspect of not just the integrity of the data, which we've talked about earlier, and that's one of the reasons for using the cloud, but also the security of the data. So a really good example is some of the recent uh, strains of ransomware attacks that are going after backups. In some cases, um, they have, have identified up to 40 different file extensions that are all backup extensions by various backup companies and they use some of the like the eternal blue type code to try and tra uh, traverse machines and laterally move within an organization leveraging credentials that are available in RAM um, where they'll scrape RAM this is all done automatically through like scripting but it'll scrape RAM using an elevated uh, account and it'll find any kind of like uh, uh, hashes for past the hash attack or a clear text password or something like that it'll use that to move laterally across an environment and then it'll drop the ransomware and all along the way and and try to actually find any backups and remove them before then encrypting all of the workstations or servers where they get their hands on within your network and so um, this is something where you've got to be thinking about how are my backups protected? Um, one is they're secure, but the other part is maybe they're going to be stored in the cloud and that way they're off, uh, off site. They're you know, not on premises and so on. Um, but um, Steve, I, I've, there's a couple ways, obviously I covered how uh, ransomware seeks out backups and that kind of thing, but what are some of your best practices around securing backups to try and protect against that or any other kind of attack on backups? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the first one is uh, something that uh, was the reason we chose CloudBerry in the first place back in 2014 was that they had something called client-side encryption. Uh, we like that in order to be, be HIPAA compliant. Um, neither the backup software vendor, in this case CloudBerry, or the back-end storage platforms, Amazon and Google, couldn't decrypt the data. So the data itself is protected. And and you know, we also point out to our customers who are using Windows Server backup, that's not encrypted. So if someone were to take that drive, they could recover it and steal all the data on it. So again, CloudBerry encrypts the, the local backup as well. So if anybody walks off with it, the data is useless. Um, so encryption you know, is the first level of protection, both in the cloud and local. But there's, you know, there, there's other you know, less obvious ways uh, the probably oh, let me give you a, a story of something that happened just uh, about a month ago to us. Someone hacked into one of our customers' servers and put crypto locker on it. Mm. But while and while they're on the server, they also they went in and opened up the backup console and deleted the backups from both Amazon and Google. Mm -hmm. I I can't tell you the panic when I mean I went to Cloudberry Explorer and I was looking and it was empty. Fortunately. I should say miraculously, the hacker was careless. They neglected to delete the local backup copy. Uh, so we were able to get everything back. So we dodged a huge bullet. Wow. So, you know, one of, the, one of the things I always do, and everybody should do, if they run into a problem, after, you, you know, the problem is over, do a postmortem and figure out what could we do, what could we have done to prevent it, what can we do to prevent it from happening again. So we now have a master password on all the client device backup consoles, including command line. That's another feature where it's, even the command line, people can go in and delete stuff. That's, that's protected as well. And we've also turned off the feature that would allow someone to delete backups from the end user's backup console. So you can go in and see it, but they can no longer delete it. We'll handle the deletion on the back end using CloudBerry Explorer if we need to delete old data. So that that protects from that particular you know exposure of someone getting onto the the server console and trying to not only you know put in ransomware but deleting the backups. And that um, customer was just a small little customer of some kind, right? Yeah. Nothing, nothing major. Yeah. Yeah. Said, yeah. 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 I, I asked because you know I. That, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, you know, it, all the everybody's heard the, the stories now that MSPs are being targeted by hackers more than ever. Mm -hmm. they, they realize that the small companies have far fewer protections than the, the big enterprises, and they can't charge as much, but they make it up in volume. So, you know, somebody getting access to you know any console that an MSP uses, whether it be an RMM console, a PSA console, backup portal, you know, they often include remote control capabilities. So, there's all kinds of damage they can, you know. 
Rick in Korea. So, yes. what, so we've, what we've done is turn it on 2FA for every one of our portals. And I, I stress to everyone, you know, the uh, – I mean, I know it's a pain. I mean, to have to enter that verification code, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 times a day. But, you know, every time I do it, I remember that horrible feeling, the pit in my stomach when I thought, you know, all the backups were gone. So – in some ways, I want you guys in the audience to feel that panic because that's the one that well, you can it's hard. You customers. can't feel it unless you've yeah, lived know. through it. But it's it's a terrifying feeling when you you realize you're screwed. You know, so all these things you'll never know if they if they <laughs> you'll never know if if these stop it. But you know, it's at least a whole other layer of protection, and you just have to do it for any portal that an MSP uses. Agreed. So let's move on to uh, recovery mistakes, our, our third of four sections here. We've got three um, mistakes we'll talk about on this one here. Um, the first one is similar to the backups, but allowing customers um, you know, to recover. Um, so we didn't, we didn't want to allow customers to manage backups in, in the, on the other slide we were talking about earlier. And so you know, allowing customers to recover seems probably, in, in my estimation, probably far more um, obvious, should be, and because it's far more critical. I mean, the backups are one thing. The, the, the worst thing that happens is they didn't you know, happen to check the right thing, and then you just, as long as you test it, you can figure out, ah, oh, they didn't check the thing, and now we, we, we've altered the backup job, and now we're good. Easy to remedy. But when it comes to recovery, um, I mean, I, am I right, Steve? It's a bit obvious, but for the customers that are thinking they're, they're tech-savvy customers should do recovery. Well. I'm assuming you think it's yeah. a bad idea. Would you share why? It's 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 a bad idea, but uh, you know you've got you know you, you use the air quotes on the tech savvy. They they think that they know what they're doing. Right. So that a lot of them think they can do restores, and now and then they'll they'll give it a try. But you know with the you know the Cloudberry that we're using, I have it set up so if any time a backup or a restore fails, I get a notification on my phone. So I know when they're trying because they always mess it up the first time they try. They don't remember the encryption key. You know, they, they don't know how to set it up properly. So I end up calling them, and they go, how did you know? I said, I knew. I'm, I'm watching. Uh, let me help you. We, we include 30 minutes of restore time per incident in our, back, in our backup and recovery service. Hmm. So that way, and we, give, and we give restores a very high priority. So there's, there's very little reason for a client to try to do any recovery themselves. And, and those who have done it, you know, long ago, we did let some people try it. But, you know. If it's a simple file and folder, well, no harm, no foul. But some of these vertical applications, they go in and try to restore one file when they really had to do database rollbacks, whole folder recoveries. You know, these third-party applications, you don't just restore a single file. And these customers weren't aware of that. You know, we have to get on the phone with a vendor. We spent hours trying to fix that problem because that the, that, the customer tried to do what they thought was a simple file recovery and ended up messing up their whole application. So you know, I, over I, time, I they've come to realize. So I, I love your 30 minutes. That makes a lot of sense from the standpoint yeah. of, if it's something super simple, they'd be like, you know, I, I, can, I can just call Steve, he'll do it. And that, that's good because then they don't try to do it on their own, even for the simplest thing, because right. it's already included. But two, um, it gives the MSP the opportunity to always, always, always have a pair of eyes on the recovery to go, oh, no, this is much more than you thought it was. This is not for files. This Correct. is an entire, right. you know, it's a multi-tiered application across, or maybe it's not, you know, but it's, it's, it's a whole application or an entire server, or there's a lot of databases, and I have yeah. to synchronize them, or whatever it is, at least somebody yeah. who really has an opportunity to look at it says, no, you're way off. You agree? But you know what the most common one is? They call so, up and they say, I think I deleted a whole folder. So, again, they call us. I call them back or whoever's, you know, available calls them back and we go onto the server, we take a look and find out, you know, seven out of ten times, somebody just dragged the folder somewhere else. Yeah. They moved it. So we simply move it back. They're thrilled because they didn't lose any, you know, work because they don't have to yep. recover up to yesterday. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, people, it, backup is, service is kind of like insurance. You know, you hope you don't have to use it, but when you do use it, you want to know that there's someone going to be there, going to take care of it for you. They're going to be, you know, like I said, we, we give them a very high priority. You know, we usually get back to them in, you know, 10, 15 minutes tops. Um, 
and and we just get right there. We actually walk them through it, talk them through it, and uh, and it's worked out well for us. And again, they don't even try anymore. Which is they I think that's the point. That, ideal. It's that thirty minutes that does it. I'm telling you, that's the reason. So yeah. let's yeah, uh, let's more complicated. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Right, and then you're already there. You're already in, involved. Um, yeah. well, the other recovery mistakes here for MSPs is the idea where the backups, certainly I, I like the, uh, the analogy of it being an insurance policy. And if it is more like thought of as an insurance policy, it tends to be more focused on just let's have a copy of everything, you know, so that we have a copy of everything as opposed to what this bullet is implying, actually having backups that are defined with recovery in mind. The best backup strategy is one where you started with recovery and worked backward. You start with the business needs, uh, you figure out what operationally has to be back up and running, what the recovery time and recovery point objectives look like for those workloads, for those data sets, whatever it is. You work backwards to define, therefore, what does the backup, what do the backups need to look like? So, for example, if I know that in a recovery, that the recovery point objective is no more than 15 minutes, so I'm not going to lose any more than 15 minutes worth of data. I have to then, if I work backwards, I have to have backups every 15 minutes in some way, shape, or form that are going to allow me to recover that data within a 15-minute uh, time window. So one of the mistakes here is it not being DR-focused. So um, Steve, at thinking about this a little bit, in your mind, what's the difference in execution for backups that are DR-ready versus ones that are not? Is it kind of the stuff I said? Is it more? What I miss? Well, uh, when I say, I mean, disaster implies that you're going to lose the server, you know, machines, that you're going to lose your local backups even. I mean, local image and local virtual machine backups are obviously a good start. And they provide that operational recovery. You know, if the multiple hard drives fail, well, you can recover from that. You know, typically a daily local image or and, and or virtual machine backup to the, to the local drive um, will give you that operational recovery. But, you know, we, we have to tell our clients that, you know, Fires, storms, and more, most likely ransomware attacks are the ones that are going to render the server and local backups useless. So, you know, we have, you know, our standards local backup service, which, which we do include as an add-on option, uh, but we pretty much insist everybody use it, uh, has those local image and virtual machine backups. But we also have an additional add-on to our service that sends images in the virtual machines to uh, Google Nearline on a weekly or monthly basis, again, depending on the change rate of the, of the, you know, the operating systems for, the, for each client. And when they sign up for that, you know, that way we have access from anywhere to those images. Um, we also include access to our expedited recovery server. We, we keep a spare test server in our office that's got enough CPU, memory, and disk to handle any one of our clients' computing needs. So, you know, when they sign up for our, our cloud disaster recovery backup, we give them uh, the right to use that server as well to get them back up and running a lot quicker than if they had to go buy a new server or wait for the old one to be accessible after the fire or what have you. Um, so we, we actually, I mean, I can actually had a situation about a month ago where we actually had to, we got a chance to put that whole process uh, into effect for someone who got hit by ransomware. That kind of ties into this last one here, an ability to expedite DR. Um, we, we've talked thus far in very small business terms, a lot of ways, where we're talking about on-premises servers, recovering to an on-premises server or a system, or whatever the case is. We have talked about using the cloud for storage. Um, but there is this ability to, to expedite DR and in those instances where it needs to be done more quickly than just let's, whatever you had before, let's put that back in place. And I, I like your expedite server kind of mentality, like a, a, a test server of some kind. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about that as well. And then also for you guys in the audience, there's also the idea of maybe even leveraging the cloud as your recovery point. Uh, where you're going to be recovering to some kind of uh, infrastructure in the cloud and that kind of thing that's always possible, especially if you're using just about any of the big three providers and, and many more beyond that. You have an ability to recovery to the cloud. But would you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what that scenario looks like and how you're able to speed things up maybe a little more tactically? Sure. I mean, again, I mean, I'll talk about the, you know, we're, we've been using this spare server as our disaster recovery server for our clients for quite a few years. And we are, you know, moving towards leveraging the cloud-based DRs uh, 
we've got some going with Amazon, Azure, and even Ramnode, which is uh, very you know, price competitive. Um, but what we've done is in our office where we have a 250 megabit ISP connection, uh, you know, we, we had a situation, like I said, where the customer got infected. Um, and what we did is once we realized that the local backup was no good, the server was no good, we immediately, from our office, we'd log into the CloudBerry uh, console, and we would use the client's um, credentials and downloaded a 100 gigabyte image in an hour to our spare server as a virtual server. So our test server has the hypervisor on it. We bring down the image as a Hyper-V VHDX file, and we mount it up, and uh, we got it up and running. So after that, you know, after we had the image on it, we then had to restore all the client data. They had 350 gigs of data. Had we tried to do it at the client site, it would take six, seven hours. We did it in two. So here we are at our location. You know, and again, we're doing this at our office, so there's no one having to be on site, charging the customer all that time to be on site. We could be working on other things while the restores were running. And, and when it was all done, we loaded the server up and drove it to 20 miles to the customer site, you know, spent a few hours getting everything all, you know, hooked up and configured, get the workstations connected. Um, and then we, you know, basically in what it was like 10 or 12 business hours, they were back up and running. We took the old server back to our office, and that way we could clean it all up and reload it, and, you know, as time permitted. So it, it was a, you know, eventually we'll do that with the cloud. Uh, that way we can handle regional disasters if we had to. You know, I mean, obviously we could handle maybe one or two clients with our server, but if if we had five or six that had a disaster from a storm, that would be a challenge. So that's where the, the those cloud uh, recovery services. But there, there's been some technical issues with with that having to do with you know generation two and UEFI, uh, you know, technical stuff that's made it difficult until very recently to actually bring up a virtual machine uh, that you had on your local server, bringing that up in you know, Amazon. But uh, you know that's that's really the next place to look, and that ultimately will be where we provide our cloud-based disaster recovery. But yet, you, you have to be backing up to the cloud. You have to get images or virtuals up to the cloud. You don't have to do it every day. Once a month is typically fine. You know, some of our bigger customers, we do it once a week. Um, but that's you know that's plenty good enough because once you get the image back on, you don't have to reinstall all the applications, and that's where you save. A ton of time, because you—I mean, some of these third-party applications take hours and hours on the phone with a vendor to get installed and configured properly. And what I like about the the conversation here is that you're focused on the the, the end result. There, the, you, you, the last thing you said is actually the most important, which is you're thinking about the applications, getting the the customer operational again. It's not about just the. Right. I took the backup job and recovered it, but you got to actually think about what's going to be necessary. Yeah. And in some yeah. cases, the cloud is necessary more than. than but we could make more money if we charge the customer for you know five days of on-site time, but that's not our focus. We that's, you know, we, that's we the wanna... last bill that they'll pay for you, and that's about it. <laughs> well, that's right. I mean, yeah. you know, especially if they find out that you know. So we tell them sign up for this service, and the service isn't expensive. I mean, the to, to store, it's manage and store those images in the cloud. We we charge a flat fee. You know, depending, you know, you get like two or three different prices, but it's just not a lot of money because really all you're paying for is a one plan to be managed per month and, you know, a few hundred gigs in the cloud. I mean, 300 gigs in the cloud costs you $3 a month if you have it on just one, which is what we do. We keep those just in, in your line. That makes good sense. Let's do this. We have, we have one more uh, group of mistakes here. And uh, just to remind you guys in the audience, if you got questions, stick this in the Q&A box. We'll have a little bit of time left over at the end uh, to go through questions. And if you don't have any, we'll just let class out early, and that's okay. We can do that, too. Um, but don't, just if, don't, feel free to put some in there. I've got, got the Q&A box open. We'll be happy to answer those as we're, uh, we're walking through this. So the last one here is business mistakes. And here we're talking about the business of offering a backup service. Uh, and uh, the first mistake here is um, using more than one solution. In some cases, this may not be by choice. 
this might be because your customers have a solution already in place that the last MSP left or whatever the case is and they purchased it. And so you're, you're leveraging what they have because they don't want to buy something new, et cetera, et cetera. And so there are some, some common issues that you can see that would happen from that. One is you have to learn every one of those solutions. You may not be as adept. They may not have the same feature sets. Um, you certainly can't have a predictable recovery process because you'd have to write up one for every single solution. So that makes you less predictable, less profitable, and so on. I mean, there's, there's a ripple effect here. In some ways, um, if it were up to me and I was faced with a customer that says, well, we're not gonna pay for a new solution, um, I probably would just go, uh, let me figure out the math and I'm just going to eat it because I'd rather have them on one solution than have to support multiples. Um, uh, Steve, from your standpoint, is it possible to find the answer on a single solution or, you know, have you faced some of this and what'd you do? Well, you know, we, we basically, as you said, we only support one solution. We, we support the you know, MSB 360 managed backup solution. That's the only one that we provide that full service backup and recovery for. We do have some, you know, smaller customers who, you know, use, you know, the, some other cloud backup product, but we simply don't manage it for them, you know, and, and then we run into all the problems because they're not paying attention to it. Um, so we only support one, you know, and that way the backup specialist only has to, as you said, only be, you know, I only work with one console, I only work with one set of products um, to be able to, you have to have a very flexible solution, though, in order to have one meet all your requirements. So, you know, we're using the managed backup solution for single PCs with one gig all the way up to servers with five terabytes and eight virtual machines, and we don't have any problem with that. I mean, it, the we can actually get those backups done. You can scan three, four terabytes in about an hour. I mean, it's it's fast, so we don't have to worry about you know. Geez, is that too much data to send to the cloud? Do we need an appliance? Um, you know, there are, I'm sure, you know, if, if, you know, if we've got a customer that had 500 workstations and 10 servers, uh, we probably would go with something, you know, that it's an appliance-based solution. But that's overkill for just for any of these small businesses, pretty much. So, you know, you need to have a product that's got uh, flexible retention periods, you know, Flexible, you know, you want something, as you said before, we have some customers that have to get a backup every 30 minutes for their, you know, they got one of their industrial, uh, you know, manufacturing machines. They, they, they said, we have to get that every 30 minutes. So we create a plan and we back them up every 30 minutes. It's not a problem. As long as your product has that flexibility, you know, like I said, different retention periods, different types of licenses, um, supports local, cloud, multiple cloud backups, and, you know, you want to be able to have the capability to switch cloud backups if you need to. So having it be able to support a wide a variety of backends is a definite plus. So I, in my opinion, you know, you should be able to standardize on one product as we have um, as long as you choose the right one. Yeah, I, I would tend to, to agree compli uh, completely. It, it's just going to make things easier in the long run. The, uh, the last one we've got here is treating backups like a cost center. And this is for probably more so for the most of you that are thinking about backups as just being that thing you kind of do because you know you may need to make some backups but haven't really thought about it as a service that you can generate revenue from. So therefore, it's just a cost center to you. And, uh, and the, the reality here is that backups themselves can provide you a, a huge source of both um, recurring revenue streams and then the during recovery procedures that are in, in the case of Steve's company longer than 30 minutes but a, a, a one-off set of you know of, of recovery uh, excuse me of uh, um, streams of money coming in that way as well so you have revenue coming that are both recurring and then one-off and you can actually do this and build it in tiers of service provide different levels back up different aspects of the organization have different kinds of SLAs I mean there's lots of ways to structure this in a way that is um, you can calculate out, you know, predictability and profitability of this in terms of all the parts that are predictable. And then there's certainly the aspect that isn't like the, 
how long is it going to take to recover my entire environment? I don't know because it depends on what the disaster looks like. So those kinds of things are left to be more of you know hourly type of uh, of compensation rather than it being something built into the service. But there's some value there. I think you heard we both talked about this a little bit. That was those 30 minutes that PC Wizards offering definitely provides some value to the customer. So that if it's a minor it's just taken care of but if it's something major you're gonna have to pay for it is how it looks at so um so steve you know obviously every service an msp should be figuring out what their profit is to make sure that it's it's something they want to get into um how do you guys structure your service as much as you can or want to go into um so that you can ensure some level of profitability yeah i mean we start with our you know we actually charge our base fee on data under management. In other words, how much data are we protecting? You know, we our our minimum plan is uh, you know five gigs, um, and we have plans for 25, 50, 100, 250, ranging all the way up to you know multiple terabytes in plans. And you know, each for each larger plan, the price per gigabyte goes down. But I mean, if you, you take a look at what the cost is for licenses and storage, I mean, an example: a simple server with one license and 100 gigs of data. It's it's going to cost you maybe five bucks a month. Uh, you should be able to bill eight to ten times that for for what? Again, this is a full service backup. This is yeah. this is an all inclusive. You know, they don't have to do anything. Absolutely nothing. It's taken care of. All those responsibilities for the backup specialist, they don't have to worry about. So you know, they can, should, and do pay more for that. Um, so you you have to look at. You know what's the service worth to the customer? You know, um, it, commonly you'll you'll look at it and say, well, you know, I can get Carbonite for fifty dollars a month for a server, and it includes all the workstations. I say that's fine. Who's going to manage it? Who's going to monitor it? You go back to all those problems. You know, um, and even at fifty dollars a month, you could still make money as long as you have your labor costs, you know, understood. I mean. It, the real cost, as we know, is, is the labor. The more yeah. customers you have with that solution, remember you're spreading that labor out over all the customers. I mean, if we have 85 customers. We perform about 400 backups a night. Um, but the product is so reliable that we usually average, you know, we average around two issues a day. We spend maybe 15 to 20 minutes a day for just the daily monitoring and review of the results and, you know, fixing any issues. You know, we get maybe three to four restores a month. To take 15 to 20 minutes to complete, and you know, so it we we've structured it so that there's the base plan, and then you get to add on additional items. We charge for SQL backups because they're, you know, the licenses are more, and they can they don't take a ton of data, but we don't the the, the database itself might be 200 megabytes, but if you've got 90 days worth of full backups, it turns into real data. We have additional price for extended retention. We have, as I spoke before, we have additional price for our disaster recovery cloud image storage. Um, so you, you start out with a base price and you let people choose add-ons, you know, as they require them or want them. And when you add it all up, you're going to make a significant amount of money on your backup service. And you should be. If you're not, then you're doing something. You're pricing it wrong, is what I would say. Let's let's do this. Um, we got just a couple minutes left, and then there's at least one question that's coming in the Q and A. I'm gonna um, sum things up here a little bit, and then um, we'll be happy to 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 talk, take any other questions that come in the Q and A here, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about next steps. Uh, this, this webinar, of course, is sponsored by MSP 360. We'll talk about those to try and get you if you want to find more information about their solutions here. So you guys in the audience, your goal here is to get your backups right. That's why you're on the call. You're trying to figure out what are the 10 things MSPs always get wrong? How do I avoid those? I think we kind of covered that. Steve did a fantastic job there. So I think there's lots of opportunities for mistakes here. And, and there's probably some that we've uncovered today and ones we've even maybe kind of brushed against and you went, oh, I bet you could probably make that mistake. And yeah, there's lots of mistakes you can be making here. Um, the, the thing here is for you to kind of stop and look at what you're offering for backups. Are you offering it as an extra, as an actual service offering? Is it just plugged into something else? Should you be offering as a service offering? The answer is yes, you should. No, should you be doing that? You can decide that on your own, but Steve and I would both go, yeah. 
Um, and then you want to kind of break it down in a couple ways. You want to define what that service looks like. And that might be, again, it's, uh, am I backing up different aspects of the business? Is it just the servers? And then here's the endpoints and workstations and laptops or whatnot. Is it something in the cloud or just something on-prem? Uh, where am I, where am I going to back that up to? Am I doing it just on-prem or on-prem in the cloud? And then you start creating tiers of service. You start adding in pricing. And the important thing here is you standardize what the offering looks like. And that goes back to the using one solution. It goes back to doing your backups a certain way because you're going to do your recovery a certain way. You're standardized, standardizing. And then and you're also optimizing. You're trying to figure out ways to leverage the backup software and hardware technology that exist that support this service for running and try to figure out ways to optimize that in a way where that allows you You go back to the idea of, let's say, the backup failing. Can you automatically have the backup restart or you know, can at least be notified? I mean, you want to try and figure out how you optimize this so that it doesn't become just a matter of I have a piece of backup software and it creates backups. Instead, you're actually having it run as part of a, a service that is intent on uh, keeping your customer available. And if there's anything that presents some risk to that uh, ability, then you're being made aware, you're automatically rectifying it, you're doing something. So there's some optimization there. Um, Steve, any final thoughts before we go to some Q&A? Uh, well, I just, I just wanna you know, talk about the fact that MSB should make backup a priority service, as it really is the final defense against customer errors, ransomware, disasters, all kinds of things that can disrupt the, the business. So devoting the resources, as I said before, to uh, maintaining the backup service if, as an efficient, thorough service is probably the most important thing that uh, someone can do. Perfect, perfect. So let's do this. Well, we've got at least one question in the Q&A box while we're taking questions here. Uh, the next steps for you guys here is uh, you got three things here. You can take a look at the MSV360 blog, as well as take a look at a demo of the managed backup product. And then you can, of course, sign up for a free trial. We'll leave these up here for you if you, if you want to write those down, take a screenshot, whatever makes the most sense. Um, so Steve, one question came in from Stefan. He, uh, he or she says, um, what retention settings do you use for file and image backups for your clients? Uh, good question. Um, file backups, as I stated earlier, we, we use a, a standard of 90 day for versions and deletions. So, if, you know, you get, if you get a daily uh, update to a QuickBooks file, we'll have, not, we'll have 90, the last 90 versions of that. Um, for images, we only keep one in the cloud. And we'll send up a full monthly in most cases, because um, that's usually enough. The applications don't change that much. The OS doesn't change that much over the course of a month. Um, locally, we'll keep a couple, but in the cloud, we'll only keep one for the, the virtuals or the images. Um, and again, it, it, with the flexibility of the software we use, we can have you know file retentions of one year, two years. We have one customer who says, just keep them all. So we have you know a couple terabytes for that person. Um, yeah. And it's fine. It, 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 it works. So you really need to... to 90 days is, is good enough for just about everyone, but the, the real issue is for people like uh, accountants and lawyers, uh, tax accountants, they only touch those files sometimes once a year. So they don't realize until a year later that the file got corrupted. So for them, we recommend a 13 to 15 month retention period. And again, we don't charge them very much. You know, A few bucks extra a month uh, gives them that level of protection. Um, and, and so typically those, those industries, uh, th those types of businesses have found it to be very useful to have that year's worth of uh, cloud retention. Very good. Looks like there's no more questions that have come in, so I'm going to let us out a little early. Um, Steve, thanks for a great conversation today. I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of real insight that you helped with the audience from just your own experiences. So I really appreciate you spending the time with us today to to do that. Well, I appreciate having the time to share my experience with the backup. So thank you. Yep. It's always an honor. And for those of you who attended, thank you very much for your attention today. Hope you learned something. If you have any other questions, feel free just to stick those in the Q&A box and someone from MSP360 to reach out to you personally and make sure you get the question answered. And uh, with that, we're going to close out today's webcast and we will catch you guys in the next one. So thanks for your attention today and we'll see you later.